Welcome everyone to today's webinar from the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, providing library senior services in a COVID-19 world. If you use Twitter or Instagram, please feel free to use the hashtag Lives for Health to share your uh, thoughts and information from the webinar. Please note that this, all attendees are automatically muted upon entry and we are recording this webinar for future viewing on the National Network of Libraries of Medicine YouTube page. If you're new to Zoom, the easiest way to access the controls is to exit the full screen mode. Please put your mouse at the top of the screen and click exit full screen mode to access the control panel. We're going to be using the chat function in today's webinar. Please note that Zoom defaults to all panelists in order to share your questions and comments with your fellow attendees. Please select all panelists and attendees from the drop down menu. This webinar does provide closed captioning. Please click on the closed caption icon on the control panel to access the closed captioning features. If you need technical support during the webinar, please use the Q&A function. This ensures that I see your comment and it does not get lost in the chat function. If you're struggling to hear myself or the speakers, you may need to adjust the audio settings on your computer. The audio settings are on the lower left hand side of the Zoom panel and you may need to change your setting to computer speakers or a headset if you're using one. If the volume is too loud or too soft, please adjust the volume letter level on your headset or speaker. Uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I want to remind everyone that this webinar does provide one continuing education credit from the Medical Library Association, and I will send the link for that with the recording in about a week. I want to quickly introduce myself as today's host. My name is Bobby Newman, and I am the Community Engagement and Outreach Specialist with the Greater Midwest Region of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. I connect with the public libraries in our 10 state region and across the country. And like many of you, I'm working from home during COVID, um, so please excuse my dog if you hear her barking. She's usually pretty well behaved, but the squirrels um, are not always. <laughs> so before we get to our presentation today, I want to do a quick word about who we are. You may be familiar with some of these acronyms, but some people are a little confused about exactly how NNLM falls into this. The National Institutes of Health is the nation's leading medical research agency. Right now, many of you might be more familiar with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases headed by Dr. Fauci. It's one of the many institutes and centers at NIH. The National Library of Medicine is also an institute at NIH. It is the world's largest biomedical library, which maintains and makes available a vast print collection and produces electronic information resources such as PubMed and Medline Plus. And NLM is the National Network of Libraries of Medicine is an outreach partner or program of NLM. The NNLM is made up of eight geographical regions um, from which the GMR or Greater Midwest Region is one of them. An exciting presentation planned for you today, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with our speakers. Glenna is the Life Enrichment Liaison at the Gail Borden Public Library. It was recently named a mover and shaker by Library Journal. And we have David with us from the St. Charles Public Library, where he is an outreach services librarian. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, David, and you can take over. Perfect. All right, how to provide library service to seniors, the most vulnerable population affected during COVID-19 has been the question raised by outreach librarians across the United States. According to the Center for Disease Control or the CDC, eight out of 10 deaths related to COVID-19 are individuals aged 65 years and older. While we might not be able to visit our seniors or facilities in person for their safety for the foreseeable future, libraries can reach this population as they shelter in place. In this presentation, find tips through the St. Charles Public Library Districts, the Borden Public Library District recommend in serving the senior demographic during COVID-19. These tips may apply across senior living communities, 
such as independent living, assisted living, skilled care, memory care, developmental housing, as well as for virtual memory cafes, for at-home caregivers of seniors, and for active seniors facing social isolation while sheltering at home. Not only can you serve the seniors in your community, but you can empower many to become volunteers from home as well. So remember, in today's climate, valuable programs really aren't supposed to be perfectly executed anymore. It's more about having them being pleasantly engaging, and that takes a little pressure off. Um, if you decide that you're going to go for it and make a video, as we describe in the program today, um, just remember, a video made by you will feel to viewers like visiting with a friendly community member. And trust me, you'll get used to working with a camera after your first hundred takes or so. <laughs> And whatever programming you provide, compassion is what matters today. Our first eight tips rely on technology, and we acknowledge that this is not available to all seniors. Each of the 50 states has an Area Agency on Aging, or AAA. Please check with yours to see if federal funding is available to place devices and Wi-Fi in the hands of seniors in your community. And not all seniors are willing or able to rely on technology to be connected. Hi, David. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're going in and out a little bit. Um, if you could, is there a way to get a little bit closer to the mic? Sure. Sorry. <laughs> well, continuing on then, for tips 9 through 15, we're going to focus on methods other than technology for serving seniors in your community at this time. And before we begin to share these tips, we just wanna thank all of you for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. We look forward to hearing your ideas during the question and answer segment. So please, at any time, go ahead and start typing those in. Uh, we really wanna make this a whole community sharing opportunity here. We acknowledge that we have a broad variety of listeners today. Uh, perhaps you're the main desk librarian at a small rural library or a branch. Uh, perhaps you work in a suburban or an urban library. Maybe you work in a senior care community or you're an at-home caregiver. Maybe you're retired. We hope that you'll be able to see yourself and your community in some of the examples that we offer today. Just one person with one idea can create a community of seniors through activities and spaces. So if you can partner with other community organizations, the workload can be shared. Will any of the following tips work for you? We hope so. So the number one tip that we're going to share today is to provide live virtual programs at senior care facilities using Zoom. Have facility staff display programs on big screen TVs, allowing seniors to easily see and socially distance around. Encourage engagement conversations and singing. Showcase topics that trigger reminiscence, such as the Rat Pack or I Love Lucy. Sing songs that residents of your community would likely know, such as America the Beautiful, This Land is My Land, Oh Susanna, I've been working on the railroad, or for he's a jolly good fellow. Stored across many areas of the brain, so even a person who has lost some verbal ability can still sing. Empowers people to breathe deeper, have better posture, and to engage with others. Crossing that comfort zone to lead a song with seniors has big payoffs in the smiles and cooperation you will very likely receive. Test technology ahead of time with facility staff. Thanks. Oh, David, I'm gonna jump in here. I apologize. Um, I'm sure this is a Zoom issue and um, I'm not sure what's happening, but we, we're having, David is cutting in and out. Um, I'm gonna suggest that you both turn off your, your videos um, that might help with some bandwidth issues we have. And um, some people are getting a little bit of feedback. Um, so maybe if you're, I know this will be a little difficult because you're going back and forth. If you're not speaking, if you can mute, I, I apologize. Sure, we can give that a try. We are the king and queen of like things going wrong and recovering. <laughs> no problem. No um, problem. For right now, I'll be on and then I'll mute when I'm finished here. Um, so going back, just want to thank you, David, for that last little segment. 
And also for home care partners, or if you run a memory cafe for home caregivers and their loved ones who are living with chronic conditions, which might include mild cognitive impairment from Alzheimer's disease, stroke, Parkinson's disease, brain trauma, et cetera, you can create a virtual trip like David described from destination photos or by using nonfiction youth books on any topic of interest. Youth books are recommended because they have beautiful color photos, large print captions, and their information is great for getting conversations going. Also, you might be pleasantly surprised if you try singing with your loved one. Choose a song that both of you are likely to know, such as the ones that David listed. Patriotic songs like America the Beautiful are often well received. Music and memories are stored in a variety of places across our brains. And that's why someone who may have lost some verbal capacity can often still sing along with you. Singing gets people sitting up straighter, breathing better, and it empowers them through engagement. Another idea is to provide Facebook Live programming that appeals to multi-generational audiences so that grandparents, parents, and children can engage together at home. Examples of programs for Facebook Live would be crafting instructions, short stories, or pre-recorded videos on topics that are shown and then discussed live through the comments. At Gail Borden Public Library District, we run daily programs presented by our staff at 11 a.m., 2 p.m., and 7 p.m. on Facebook Live. And you can view those at any point in time by going to our Facebook page, Gail is spelled G-A-I-L, Gail Borden Public Library, on Facebook, and then just click on videos, and you'll see some examples of what we've done. Maybe you're working individually or with a team. You can record virtual programs that facilities, at-home care partners, and virtual memory cafe moderators can play on demand. What I like to do is I'll store my programs in a Google Drive, and then I send the shareable links out to the presenters. At the 24 care communities that I serve, the directors there will download those videos that I send them. They'll click on the link, download the video onto their laptops, then they place the laptops on rolling carts, and they show videos from the doorways to their residents' rooms. That way, there's no cross-contamination of devices. You can select themes that will inspire conversations, including we've done things like baseball, we've done great American amusement parks, we've done the Wild West. You can incorporate props and music. I like to use copyright-free photos and videos. I go on to Creative Commons Zero License for those and photos I've taken myself. Um, retired teachers, librarians, historians, and others in your community might be willing to volunteer to use library databases to help you put together 10 or 20 minute programs on topics that they enjoy. I have a team of about 10 to 12 volunteers who jump in and help me all the time. You can find volunteers with the help of clergy in your community and also go to your social organizations in your community, like your Kiwanis Club, your Lions or Rotary Club leaders. In Geneva, Illinois, we have a counterpart whose name is Meredith Anderson in Library Outreach, and she's currently recording videos of herself talking about topics such as the health benefits of laughter. She includes a few jokes and she even ties in a few historical perspectives related to laughter. So that's another idea of something that you could do. You can see her contact information on our very last slide uh, if you have further questions and she is available if you'd like to reach out. So I'll turn it over to David here. I'm gonna go on mute. Thank you, Glenna. Another way you can reach seniors who are isolated is by simply putting together your own show and tell from items you have around your home or that you can procure from your local library if their drive-up windows are open. Number four, host one-on-one -on -one engagement programs at facilities using Zoom. Craft PowerPoint presentations incorporating songs and video clips. Follow copyright guidelines. Share your screen with seniors. Have facility staff available to navigate computers and assist with technology. Senior patrons will be happy to see you. Number five, an even simpler approach may be to read poems, folklore, short stories or jokes over the phone, Skype, FaceTime or through a call in Zoom meeting. Our fellow librarian, 
Mary J. Lepo of the Arlington Heights Memorial Library in Illinois is using Zoom for seniors to call into programming with their phones. Her contact information is included at the end of her slides if you have some follow-up questions. Even a 10-minute call can make a difference in someone's day. While a senior with memory loss may not be able to remember that you called, that lingering uplifted mood can remain with them for a length of time after the call. Your time and investment does make a difference. Discuss books and movies that seniors are watching. Provide readers advisory. Remain focused on library related topics, but realize that this call can double as a well being check. Call in Zoom meetings are a good option if you are not able to make a lot of calls. Let callers reach your program set for a specific time. Arrange with individuals ahead of time so their phone numbers don't show when they call in. Number six. Alternatively, set up a phone line where community residents can dial in to hear a recorded program or short story that runs for a week. Consider enlisting the help of active senior volunteers in your community to make these recordings for you. This saves you time and offers a meaningful way for active seniors to contribute from home. Number seven, provide video links to free virtual tours and information, local, regional, and national museums, national parks, and historic landmarks. This is an important time to connect with organizations within your community to help promote and support them. Perhaps collaborations are in your future. Number eight, compile a list of websites that display free printable activities, such as word searches and crossword puzzles, distribute to activity directors, memory cafe moderators, and at-home caregivers. They can print activities for seniors on demand. The Elgin Public Live Museum and the Downtown Neighborhood Association in Elgin have turned photos of the city of Elgin into virtual puzzles. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Glenna. All right, well, for several years, David and I have been developing handouts that can be printed by activity directors to engage seniors or to include them. And you can include those handouts in home service material deliveries. Handouts can feature topics including classic entertainers such as Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, John Wayne. And you can also consider sharing information based on science, like we've done butterfly migration, rainbows and sundogs, or ice castles. Or you can look to historical facts about inspiring people like Martha Berry, Mary Cassatt, or Ernest Homley. Silliness, pet photos, and humor are usually appreciated, along with a bit of believe it or not. We have challenged senior residents to list all of the different pets that have lived in the White House over the years. Uh, you can utilize library databases when creating your handouts. Handouts should be printed in 16-point font. They should be limited to just one page and they should include photos, allowing those with limited vision or who are experiencing mild cognitive impairment to easily read and follow along. Reading aloud is empowering for those living with dementia, and most people with dementia can read through the later stages. For number 10, you can partner with your library's youth services department and community volunteers to encourage community members of all ages to write letters and cards to seniors residing in facilities. Uh, include heartwarming notes, inspirational messages, photos. People have even sent in hand knit or crocheted gifts. For tip number 11, we have home service deliveries. They are adapting. Some may be mailed through the US Postal Service. Others are delivered via bookmobile or library vehicle or personal car with mileage reimbursement. Gail Borden Library previously had one staff member. She's pictured here, Sarah, in the center of the screen. Um, she was heading up a team of 20-some volunteers who would take books around to senior care communities and or private homes in our district. 
Now Gail Borden has shifted to move staff into those roles in order to keep volunteers safe for the time being. Gail Borden is also offering to deliver materials to any resident requesting service. So in the past, we worked on a trust system that when someone requested home services, they truly couldn't come in for physical, mental, or transportation challenges. But now, uh, with everyone being socially isolated, we've opened up the service to all who feel uncomfortable. Our drive-up windows are open for materials pickup, but even if they're uncomfortable with that, we're happy to bring out our home service deliveries. Um, home service volunteers have been invited in the meantime, while they're not doing deliveries, to help from home by writing those letters to senior and developmental communities, or if we go back, we don't have to physically go back, but David's slide number six showed us that volunteers are invited to record a poem or do a short story of their choice. We have a program at Gail Borden, which we've named Phone Reads. The idea came from the Denver Library. And what they're doing is our volunteers record a message that the public can call in to hear. We change the message each week. We do this in both English and Spanish. There's no charge to listen to the recorded phone reads message. Callers are responsible for their own phone contract costs in order to place the call. But we'd like to invite you to give our phone reads a call so that you can hear what it sounds like. The number, I'll give it to you two times here, it's 847-608-4300. I should sing it like a little cartoon comic strip thing, but I won't. 847-608-4300. And we'll turn it over to David then. Thanks. Volunteering from home can be a fulfilling contribution by seniors and a time-saving support for your community. Identify volunteers through local clergy, bulletin boards and businesses, or through your library website. Both David and Glenna have seniors who regularly tear newspaper into strips for animal bedding at the animal shelter that sits between our library districts. At least two of the groups who contribute live in memory care. Would seniors in your community be willing to cut out paper craft materials to help restock your youth department's craft area? In Elgin and St. Charles, we have seniors who make and donate fidget quilts for those living with dementia. We also have volunteers who make baby blankets for Welcome Baby First Library Card visits. And now I'm going to turn it over to Glenna. You can also become trained in and offer a Next Chapter Book Club, a program that originated from The Ohio State University for those with special needs. If working with group homes, the employee who serves as leader of the home may be able to help connect residents with you through Zoom. Take turns reading a book or a short story selected by the group, making sure that there are enough copies for each of the participants to have one. Non-readers may partner with readers in order to echo sentences and have a sense of belonging and empowerment. You can offer book clubs and readers advisory discussions for active seniors and offer the opportunity to have senior volunteers lead clubs within your library or your branch. Um, when we all get back together again, you may want to host a jigsaw puzzle club or chess clubs, read with Rover, etc. And back to David. Share a list of resources for food, medicine, medical care, and financial assistance via your website, social media pages, and printed flyers that can be posted in grocery stores, houses of worship, apartment entryways, and other community common areas where, people, where many people will see them. And then for our tip number 15, partner, partner, partner. Uh, this is a wonderful way to share the workload and it often results in exponential payoffs across your community. So some places to consider are senior centers. What about parks and recreation departments, healthcare clinics, social organizations, houses of worship, and other businesses and organizations in your community? You can just reach out and kind of ask what they're doing and let them know that you have some library resources you'd be glad to jump in and assist with. Maybe there'd be a way that you could help. Um, you can also consider opening, when we all get back together, a memory cafe. We're currently running our memory cafes in English and Spanish. We're doing it virtually. 
and it has taken some time. We always do a zero session with our seniors so that they have a chance to kind of come on, spend some time playing with the devices and making sure that everything works, uh, but we get them there. Also, there's dementia-friendly communities. Elgin has become a de dementia-friendly community, and we then joined the Mayor's Caucus in the suburbs of Chicago. So we have a whole set of people that are working together to make things good for age-friendly and dementia-friendly communities. We became certified dementia practitioners at Gail Borden Library. There are three of us on staff that went through the day-long training. It's an eight-hour training process uh, through the uh, NCCDP. It's the National Certification. Oh, I'll have to look it up and let you know, but <laughs> NCCDP, and they are based out of New Jersey. So those are some options that you can think about moving forward. And I think at this time, I'll turn it back to David, and he's going to kind of do the wrap up here. And also definitely consider reaching out to your agency on aging to see what funds are available and to see how you can better serve your seniors using technology. Before we move to the question and answer portion of our webinar, I would like to invite you to send your email addresses to Glenna's email in the contact sheet if you would like to continue this conversation via Zoom meeting. We thought you might have specific questions pertinent to your community and might like to share best practice ideas and suggestions through another channel as a follow-up to this meeting. Attending the Zoom meeting will be free and Glenna will send you the date and time it will take place outside of this webinar. We want to keep the conversation going. And finally, as seniors shelter in place in our isolation for safety, outreach librarians must discover new techniques to engage this population. While traditional library senior services has changed, our responsibility to deserve this population remains. Outreach librarians must navigate the COVID-19 world as an adventure exploring methods to remain relevant in seniors' lives and at facilities. Great, thanks, uh, David and Glenna. So we've got a lot of time for questions, which is good, and I've been I'm grabbing some out of the chat box. I think turning off the um, videos did help, so I'm actually gonna turn mine back off. <laughs> Feels a little weird to, to do it without it, but I think that will help with the sound email or the sound issue. Um, okay, so let's see some of the questions I've gotten. Uh, someone is saying that their local senior center uh, are keeping seniors restricted to their rooms and so that group activities aren't allowed right now. Do you have any suggestions? That's one thing that I'm up against as well. I think it's pretty common across the country right now. So what I have done is I've made some videos and sent them over. That was um, the way that I did it was dropping them into my Google Drive. And then from there, I could share that link. When I say making videos, we kind of took it to the nth degree because that's something that our staff has a background in. But you can also do it on your own, just as if you're simply having a conversation. You could pop on Meredith Anderson, uh, her contact information is on here, does a beautiful job of putting the camera up. It's kind of like doing a selfie and she talks about whatever's going on. She might talk about, you know, just common things that are happening in the community. She has all different types of topics. There's no wrong thing to say. It's just getting a message out there and then sending it over to the activity directors. They have been more than accommodating. Um, they're looking for some support, I think, at this point in time. And so really, we're not causing more work. We're giving something to help out is the way to kind of look at it. Uh, so that's been very successful for those who have been staying in their rooms. They look forward to hearing from us regularly via video. Or even just a simple phone call to your patrons at facilities works as well. Just give them a call on the phone, provides a well-being check. And they'll love to hear from you. We do that at all of our facilities, calling the residents and checking with facility staff to see which resident really could use a friendly voice to talk to. Great, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> another question. Uh, most of my friends are seniors, as am I. However, they are not computer illiterate. What suggestions do you have for connecting with them? There are all different opportunities for becoming a volunteer. Um, 
what my volunteers love to do, some of them are not real computer savvy. Uh, so they've been handwriting the messages to that go out to the seniors that are in the living communities. Some of them enjoy doing crafts. And so they've put together some little craft packets using library supplies. We can do the three day waiting period where, you know, we wait and make sure that it's in quarantine long enough that it's then safe to give to our seniors. So some of my volunteers enjoy just putting together paper craft items into baggies. They make little kits and then we'll deliver those and let them sit in quarantine for a bit. So those are some ways that volunteers can be involved without having to do it through the computer. Or as Glenn and I have, are very proud of one of the projects that we do is with our fidget quilt projects that we do in our respective communities. People of any age craft fidget quilts, either through knitting or crocheting or quilting, and, and then they can donate them to senior facilities for patrons living with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Uh, helps relieve the stress and nervous tension of individuals living with Alzheimer's disease. Good. Uh, some people have some questions about the um, Colin story um, reading or uh, that are done on the phone. So. Um, how are you doing those? Are they, they're taped before and then people call in? I anticipated this question because I don't work in this. So I got in touch with my IT guy who is awesome. And here's what he said. He said, I just use the Mitel phone system that the library already has with an automated attendant. So at the library, we already had an extra line. So this, you, I guess you have to buy them in bundles. So this didn't cost the library any extra money. Um, the files are recorded. And so um, they get sent over. So you can use, you know, whatever kind of software you want to do in order to do the recording. Um, send them over to the Mitel phone system. And then he uses Audacity. A-U-D-A-C-I-T-Y is the name of the product in order to convert the files so that they work with the phone system. And so what happens is our volunteer director, Kim, um, she sends out the invitations regularly to volunteers. She said, we're looking into creating something similar for the Gail Borden community to what the Denver Public Library did. We would like to know if anyone would be interested in being recorded reading. There are more details to be ironed out yet, but I wanted to let you know some of the opportunities we're looking into. And so she sent that out and got a big response back through email. Our volunteers read in both English and Spanish. And they kind of get to choose whatever they want. I know we recently had something about Mark Twain. Um, one of my volunteers read a poem that she really enjoyed. So there's like no wrong way to do it. We've had a lot of success. And for further follow up, I'm happy to email more information. I know that didn't probably cover all of it. So if you have more questions, let me know. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so a question about home deliveries. What protocol do you have in place uh, for for cleaning or quarantining materials that you pick up and deliver to patrons? Um, so the St. Charles, we are just in the beginning phases of doing this for our library. Right now we're doing books by mail. Books by mail, what we do is we actually ordered um, envelopes, padded envelopes from Staples, and we will put them in there that they can easily throw away. Uh, we're currently starting contacts delivery and the next phase of a reopening. And with our facilities, we are going to bring them bins and uh, they will be dropping, we'll be putting everything in a brown paper bag that will have been quarantined before bringing it over. And then we will be sent it for return to bringing over bins that can be rolled and we will be sanitizing the bins before we bring it onto our library van. And Gail Borden's procedure is very similar. We have the disposable bags now. We're not taking the bags back and circulating them anymore as we used to do. We used to run them through the dryer in order to get rid of, you know, should there be any creepy crawlies that would have taken care of it. Uh, now we're just doing the disposable bags back and forth. Um, the staff is wearing PPE as they do their deliveries, even though we're just leaving things on porches. We're letting people know ahead of time. So there's a contactless kind of exchange. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Oh, lots of questions about the memory cafes. And I know you mentioned that briefly. Um, I was gonna pull up the website. So can you um, go a little more into depth about what those are and how you're doing them virtually? 
Sure, glad to talk about that. We started in 2018, August of 2018, we held our first Elgin Memory Cafe. And the concept of a memory cafe, it started in Denmark actually, went to the UK, then made its way through Minnesota and came on down to Illinois. Um, we meet with people who are caregivers to someone with mild cognitive impairment for any variety of reasons. It could be dementia, it could be um, dementia from Parkinson's disease, it could be a brain trauma if there was a brain injury of some sort. Um, stroke, etc. And both together, now some memory cafes meet with the groups individually, the caregivers go to one place and then those that are living with the dementia uh, stay in the other room, but we meet all together. Uh, it's just an option that we went for. So we get together, it's a social event. There's, it's not a support group. The concept is there's no real set agenda. The whole thing is just to get together and have a good time. So it feels kind of like you're in a neighborhood when you get together. You have people with a variety of ages, there's no um, limits. When we do our Cafe de los Recuerdos, which is our Cafe of the Memories for our Spanish speakers in our community, we invite the whole family because often the whole family is um, part of the caregiving in the family. So we usually have some kind of a fun theme that people enjoy. Uh, for Cafe de los Recuerdos, we opened that one in November of 2018 with a mole tasting event because we knew people were going to be serving mole at Thanksgiving and we thought it'd be fun to share some recipes a little bit ahead of time. So we had five chefs who created mole for us in a test kitchen in downtown Elgin. And it was wonderful. The grandmas were there um, sharing their recipes with the chefs who were coming out. We did kind of a taste test. We did a voting. We just had a wonderful time. We also loop in our connections with Rush uh, Medical facility and we have people who come out from the Rush Dementia Disease Center to provide resource material. They have gotten people in our Hispanic community involved in two different studies because we know that so many more people um, of color end up having higher incidence rates of dementia and we're trying to figure out why. So there's ways that you can really link with your, your medical part of your community as well. Um, for the memory cafes, the idea is that we just get together, laugh, and have a good time. It's interesting because people, when they do get together, really enjoy it. You can see that they are sharing things that, you know, they've had bottled up for a while. They just want to get together, and it's, it's been very, very positive. So hopefully that kind of gives an overview of what the memory cafes look like. We like to have one type of thing to do. Some memory cafes pay to have guest speakers. We don't. In our instance, we have no budget. <laughs> so it comes down to using library supplies. We've um, also invited guest speakers who come in for free. We have a local florist who came in and taught us how to do flower arranging. We had a local poet who came in and read some of her poetry to us and then we tried our hand at writing some acrostic poetry which we then used for a wall display inside the library. So there's lots of ways that you can connect things and connect people. Great. Uh, okay so the next questions are a little bit more um, about how you connect with your seniors. So um, how do you reach people who don't, you know, use social media, don't have access to the internet, or don't use Facebook? At St. Charles, like, um, during COVID-19, what we are doing uh, for senior facilities, we are recording everything in advance. At St. Charles, is, we have recorded about 40 programs or so. And then on the 1st and the 15th of every month, we send all 10 of our senior facilities a, we send them four recorded videos. Um, we send them a virtual program tour, such as to a park. This last, in the first, we, this month we sent them to the San Diego Zoo, virtual tour. And then we send them six engagement sheets, which is their crossword puzzles and word searches. And then uh, we send that to the activities director and they distribute it throughout the facilities. Uh, either have it as a group activity where they can socially distance around the TV uh, safely, uh, or they can also uh, bring them to a senior's room by using a facility-owned laptop or iPad that they can play the video themselves and have an engagement just with that one patron. Uh, and when they do the one-in-one -one engagement programs, uh, they, clean the la they clean the laptop or iPad after every use just to make sure it's clean and it's sanitized. 
And then by contrast, I'll describe a little about what we're doing for the active seniors in our community who are not living in care communities and may not need any kind of caregiver at all. Um, we have our Dementia Friendly Elgin Advisory Council that meets monthly. And one of the people on that council is Sherry Ashenbrenner, who is our Elgin Police Senior Liaison. So she runs a list of emails that goes out to over a thousand families in the community. And so we're constantly in touch through that email list with people throughout the community. Um, they are in touch in turn with those who are not computer savvy. So we're reaching our clergy in town and they're reaching out to their congregations. So we're able to, to get to people in that way. Um, and we're, we have a two way conversation going on. We're hearing from them what they need. We've been taking packets out to the homes of people that are running low on toilet paper, et cetera, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's a constant communication that's going on. So in addition to when we do put those kits together, we'll throw in some things like David described, some, you know, word searches and, and just things, you know, from the library that are supportive. Our library drive up windows are now open as well. So that has kind of taken some of the pressure off and we're able to, to get some things out to people as well. So th that's just another way that we're kind of reaching out. Great, thank you very much. Um, let's see. Uh, so when you are reaching out to seniors, are you reaching mostly to senior? And I think you answered this a little bit, but I just we've got at least three questions asking this. Do you mostly serve seniors who are in retirement homes or senior centers, or do you reach out to um, older adults in private homes and apartments? Um, at St. Charles, we serve about 10 different senior facilities ranges from assisted living to nursing uh, care, skilled care, memory care, independent living, uh, we a variety of senior facilities, whether it's independent or really skilled care and memory care. Uh, with our outreach team, we also reach homebound patrons with deliveries. Uh, in my outreach team, we mostly reach seniors, either they're in facilities, whether that's active senior living or skilled care and memory care. And at Gail Borden, we have a variety. Um, we do very similar to what David described. We have 24 care communities uh, for developmental and for um, other senior care communities. And then we also reach our active adults through just regular library programming. We've got our newsletter that goes out to the homes all across the district. Everyone in the district receives a newsletter uh, where they can sign up for regular adult programs. But one thing that my department really does is we really reach out to volunteers. So that's a way, you know, we think of volunteers as helping us, but we're also helping those volunteers that's breaking down their social isolation in order to contribute and make a difference for the people in the community. So that again is a two way street. It's really important that um, all seniors have opportunities within the community. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have any suggestions for volunteer activities for seniors with arthritis? I do. I saw that come up and I was excited that we were getting to it. Okay, so here's what we did. Um, we took a regular paintbrush and we went to Home Depot and go into the plumbing section. And what you do is you buy the foam, the plumbing foam that you would put around plumbing. Instead, you put it around the paintbrush. And so now the paintbrush is about as thick as a 50 cent piece. Um, so that's something that someone who, if they just have like the pincer motion with their thumb and forefinger, um, you can use a rubber band then to kind of strap that around their wrist. And then if anyone who can move their arm laterally, like from their elbow out, just a sideways motion without having to even bend your fingers, now has the capability of doing some painting. So we were really excited to, to give that a try and, and it actually worked really well. That's one thought. Another thought that comes to mind that both David and I have done is we have created fidget pouches and so that's different from a fidget quilt. The fidget pouch is where you take a um, gallon baggie, a freezer baggie, fill it with, um, I think David might have used hair gel or hand sanitizer. I know we've used both and um, it, you put that on the inside of it and then mix in some little manipulatives. So it might be like little uh, buttons or marbles um, it could be like a toy airplane, things like that. This is gonna be sealed so a person can't get it open. They still have to use it under supervision. But what you do then is you tape with uh, duct tape around the four edges of the baggie 
And then what you've created is a fidget bag so that you can, people can manipulate that. And that does help with the arthritis to keep the fingers moving. Uh, so that's just one thought of something that can be done. But they do, I, when I give them out, I give them to the activity directors who can then decide which people would be, you know, the best candidates for using those. Someone that's not going to try to rip through it and, and eat what's inside can happen. So, yeah, thanks. Do you include seniors in your summer reading programs? Always. Sorry, David, do you want to jump in? <laughs> no, we do as well. I said for outreach, we do include it, and we're trying to find new ways to include them as well. Um, I think really reading should be fun for everybody, and whether that's having, pro we always like to have prizes. Uh, one of the things that we always like to do, and we're trying to uh, expand this, is to have summer reading parties. Um, and parties throughout the year as well to encourage and promote reading. Bookmarks are so popular with the senior facilities, so we always like to give out bookmarks during summer reading as well. What we do is we take a, we do a whole summer reading kickoff in May uh, when we can go in person. And so this year we do have summer reading on hold because the staff in the care communities is just so busy right now that we didn't want to put another thing on them for this year. Uh, but in past years, what we do is a summer reading kickoff where we have a specific theme. We use the same cardboard box every year. As I said, I have no budget. So we cover a cardboard box with black uh, contact paper, and then we have turned it into a variety of things. It's been a roller coaster where we added a pool noodle to the top of it, and we used a, uh, these are the basic pieces for each time. So there's the cardboard box, and then there's also what you would put clothes on. You can kind of picture like a rolling clothes rack. It goes up and over and across, so you would hang the clothes on there. Just picture that. Instead, we throw a tablecloth over it. Now it becomes a backdrop. So if you have someone who's sitting in a wheelchair, you can put them right into the scene if they would like to be a part of it by putting the box in front of them and then that rolling clothes rack behind them. And here that we did roller coaster themes, we had the pool noodle as if it were the handle for what you hold on to. And then in the backdrop, we had the loop of a picture of like it made it look as if the person was just coming down off of the roller coaster uh, ramp. Um, we did that. We turned the box the next year into a 50s uh, diner. So we, for the backdrop, we had what looked like a 50s lunch counter. And for the front, we attached some little pretend um, shakes and malts on the front. <laughs> and uh, we are, we, the people that decorate that for us every year are our developmental group. So I go see them first. They're Association for Individual Development, people that are seniors now, but have gone through um, uh, they've been in special education all the way through school. So they're the ones that color and decorate this prop for me that I use for the whole month with all the other places that we go. And what we do is we then have the seniors talk about their experiences going to Riverview Amusement Park in Chicago, for example, when they were teenagers, or going to a sock hop and what that was like. My volunteers are gathering their stories as they're telling them during this summer reading kickoff and then I type that up into a booklet that I then give back to the activity director the next month when we come back. And now they have their very own stories and the stories of the 23 other communities in our area um, that they can read. And they take turns reading that in a small group or individually, however they want to do that on their time. Um, in order to complete summer reading, we have a chart that we give the activity directors. And they only have to read six times throughout the summer. They don't have to read a whole book. Instead, if they read one poem together, if they are read two, that counts. If they listen to an audio book or a talking book, those count. It's really about quality of life rather than quantity of reading for our seniors for summer reading. But that's kind of how we do it. So you can tell I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, for the craft packets that you were talking about earlier, are you mailing those out or are you delivering them? The craft packets that we do, uh, people can pick up in the drive through lanes um, in general for our library, which is separate from what I do. Um, those are available for different age groups at our library, but the packets that our seniors put together, they get those to me and then I deliver those myself. Um, that way I have a little bit of, um, not that I have to worry, but quality control. I know exactly what's in the kit and what's going out and I can contact, you know, make contact directly with the activity.
community directors, then they can determine who should do those kits. Great. Um, it looks like a couple of questions about how to connect with seniors who aren't living in um, care facilities who maybe don't have access to social media. As David mentioned earlier, I, I think it's worth repeating, be sure to check with your area agency on aging, your triple A, every state has one, and there is federal funding in most cases um, so that people can be given a device that usually it's a tablet and it'll have a hotspot so that people can get connected. Um, that's one thing, and the way to reach those people would be through your community organizations. Talk with your Kiwanis Club and talk with your clergy, your mayor's office, etc., to see who knows someone, because somebody knows someone, <laughs> and you can help get that material out there. Um, during non-COVID times, we have a lot of volunteers that help people with a program called Device Advice. And so it's seniors helping seniors. Those who are tech savvy will come into the library during set times, like on a Tuesday or Thursday, um, just a regular thing, and people can drop in and say, oh, you know, I got this, uh, you know, this tablet for, for Christmas and I don't know how to use it. Can you help me set it up? And so that's what our volunteers will help do. Plus our library staff helps out as well. But those are some ways to kind of reach those. We're trying to, to get into that uh, digital divide. And interestingly, we recently did a, a re recap of who in our community might need these this assistance. It wasn't necessarily our homeless community. They seem to be set with their iPhones and their, their smartphones. Um, it's more the people that you might not first think of. It would be the renters and the homeowners who have not been socially isolated before. So we had someone who joined us in Memory Cafe. Uh, we could not figure out how to unmute him in Zoom. And finally, it comes around. I had him on my cell phone at the same time. So the people on the screen are hearing me talk through the speakerphone <laughs> to him. And we finally realized, oh, your computer never had a speaker to begin with. It's that old. <laughs> and he said, oh. And so we said, well, let's just call, have him call in, have him call in. So we gave him the phone number to call in. And he said, oh, I can use my flip phone for that. So it was really sweet. So we were like, yes, yes, you can. And when we got him connected through Zoom, it was almost like, you know, we solved COVID or something. Everyone was so excited. Um, so yeah, there are ways. It just, it's, it takes time and you got to reach out. It's outside the box. <laughs> okay. And so it looks like, oh, um, you shared some information earlier about, um, being included in a later Zoom discussion. Can you uh, put that information maybe back on the screen? I think I think maybe you did, David, but just go ahead and. I said Glenna, Glenna's email address. Yeah. <laughs> yep, okay, just wanna clarify that, that. And then, uh, and you have the word searches back up, so we've done that. Um, somebody has a little bit of an off-topic question. Are you doing anything for the Illinois Veterans History Project? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, we had done some work previously. We had the, um, oh my goodness, it was prior to my time being at the library, but it was the traveling wall came to Elgin and that really got us started with our veterans programming. So uh, we have volunteers who are veterans and they do a program through my division called Visiting Veterans. So same concept of people that are um, retired military who go out to the care communities in the same way that I do, they take programs to the, the veterans and they do invite neighbors of veterans who live in the communities to join in. We have offered this program through our local um, veterans associations, but we've not had a lot of interest for people who are living at home. But we're really, you know, we keep reaching out and trying to reach that demographic as well. But it seems that the veterans who are living at home are happier being volunteers um, rather than having a program given for them at, in our community anyway. Uh, but what happens during the visiting veterans program is they open with a roll call, which is something that military personnel would be really comfortable and familiar with. They go through their name, their rank, their file. Uh, they talk about what 
projects they worked on when they were in the military, what equipment they used. They use photos to talk about those things. And then they get into other topics too. They talk about family and what they did after they left the military, the careers that they had, et cetera. So it's really a chance to get together and just visit. Um, sometimes military people can only speak to military people. There's a, an understanding there. So we wanted to make sure to make that an opportunity in our community. We also have the, um, dog who comes in. It's a therapy dog, licensed therapy dog, who comes in and does visits with the veterans as well as part of our visiting veterans program. So that's something that we are currently doing. And that was an offshoot of working with other veterans programs that were traveling through the city. Um, David and Glenna, are you willing to share your slides? Yes. Absolutely. Of course, I'd be happy to send them. Okay, great. So we'll get those sent out when we send out the recording in a week or two. Um, let's see, uh, some more, okay. Uh, you, you mentioned doing contact contactless home delivery. Are you doing that at the senior facilities as well? We will be doing, we're launching them in the next phase of a reopening. Uh, right now the St. Charles is just doing books by mail. Uh, we were currently working on procedures for doing context delivery both at um, facilities and at patrons, homebound patrons. Um, of course, there are a lot of safety measures that need to be taken in place, but we're going to be putting everything in a brown paper bag with a note on it that needs to be quarantined uh, for 72 hours. And um, at facilities, we will also be doing that again, safety first, health first, sanitation, masks, and, and gloves as well. And very same thing for uh, Gail Borden. We are also like St. Charles following all of the um, Illinois state uh, phases that we're going through. So we are not currently sending books out to care communities at this point, um, but it's something that we're prepared to do and we can't wait. What we have taken are the uh, letters, messages, et cetera, from volunteers and then from our own library department. We did 400 um, messages that went out to all of our seniors to, in the beginning to say, we really miss you. And those were the things that I just left in the vestibules, let the activity directors know were there. And then uh, those sat for the 72 hour requirement period. It's hard for people in outreach. We are so loved being with our seniors and being engaged with them, presenting programs with them, visiting with them, making them laugh and smile. It's a heartbreak. I know for both Glenna and me and our teams and everybody out there who works in senior services that we can't see them um, in person and do programs and do deliveries in person. It's a really heartbreak. And we really had to reinvent senior services uh, everybody in the world has for libraries and it's a heartbreak because we're such an in-person people. It's not the same, but you know, we do whatever we can to make a difference while we are at home and are not able to visit. Okay, great. Thank you. I am, we've got three minutes left, so I'm going to take back over the screen and do my little wrap up. Thank you both, David and Glenna, for sharing your expertise and I apologize everyone for the technical difficulties. Um, I know it's always nice to see the presenters when they're talking, but it does seem to have solved most of our audio problems um, by turning off the video. So um, we do what we can while we're doing our best right now. Um, I just want to remind everyone that the CDC is your best source for the up-to-date information on uh, COVID-19. In particular, I like to point out this section of the, of the website for COVID. Um, on daily life and coping and talking about um, stress and coping. And I know this is a stressful time, uh, both for library staff and our patrons. And to keep in mind that we're human and doing the best that we can during a, um, I'll say it, unprecedented times. I know you probably heard that um, hundreds of times. Um, also like to encourage everyone who's here today to sign up for a future webinar, Fostering Mutuality, How One Library Prepared for the Opioid Crisis. Um, this is coming up in July, and I will include a link to this in the follow-up email, along with the recording and slides. I also encourage you to reach out if you have an idea for a webinar with the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. We're always happy to host um, webinars that might be um, about health initiatives you're doing for your patrons, especially virtual things right now. Um, I know people need lots of ideas of how to do things virtually. Um, health and wellness for your library staff. It's really important that we take care of ourselves and our staff during this time and at all times. 
Um, so I'd love to hear about those and just in general environmental and behavioral impacts on health and you can feel free to send me an email with that. What next? If you're not already, please consider joining the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Uh, membership is institutional, not individual, so your organization may already be a member. Um, consider registering for more webinars and training and classes with us. All of our webinars and classes are free, and you can find that at nlm.gov slash training. Uh, just a reminder, thank you for your time and being here with us today. Thank you again to David and Glenna. Within uh, one to two weeks, you will receive a, an email with a link to the recording of the webinar, a survey to provide feedback on the webinar, and for those of you who would like a continuing education certificate or credit, instructions for that as well. And thank you so much. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.